Hey guys, it's Paul from Online Tax Academy. So in today's lesson, we've got a bit of a different setup here. And what we're going to be doing is checking out a live version of Stan Getz playing Awesome Leaves. Now, no matter what level you're at, whether that's a complete beginner all the way up to an advanced player, checking out some of these famous recordings is one of the best ways to start to improve your own saxophone playing as well. And of course, it's just nice to check out some great music as well. So for today, we're going to be checking out how Stan Getz plays the tune Autumn Leaves. And you can get this PDF for free. That's in the link below at onlinesaxacademy.com. Now what we have here is the score up in concert pitch, but you can get the alto sax and the tenor sax versions as well for free. Now, some of the more experienced players here may have noticed we're not in the usual key for Autumn Leaves. We're in C minor. Now, normally it's in G minor. So along with this direct transcription, I've also transposed it into the more usual key. And this means you can try out some of these phrases in the key that you're maybe normally used to playing Autumn awesome Leaves in. And all of those resources are available for premium members. All right, so we'll get started. So before the first phrase of the melody kicks off here, we've got this little intro that he plays. Check this out. It's such a cool, elegant phrase. So before we dive into any like complicated harmonic analysis or anything like that, just listen to the way he's playing those notes. They're all very joined up. They're all really legato and joined up. He's still articulating these notes, but he's doing something called legato tonguing. So this is the first thing you can take away from it. Legato tonguing is when you're blowing constantly, but your tongue is interrupting that airstream just by lightly flicking that reed. So you get this really joined up sound of just have one more listen. Now, another idea you can take from this without knowing anything about music theory is just the fact that he's got all these doubled notes. That's kind of like one of the main hooks of this phrase. So you can take that idea of instead of playing every note different all the time, try doubling in pairs of notes like this. And you've got this constant eighth notes, which gives it lots of forward momentum, but you're not having to change note every time, which makes it a bit easier on the fingers and you can really think about the melodic shape. Now, just to dive a little bit more into the harmony, if we, he's basically thinking F minor here. And if we put in the scale degrees, he's playing three, three, seven, seven, the natural seven there, two, two, seven, seven. And it's carrying on thinking still in F minor, we've got one, one, because it's two Fs, five, five, and then we have the flat seven here. So it's a bit of a guide tone line. This natural seven is falling to the flat seven. And there we have another five, five. Now this bar here, he could be thinking G half diminished, which would be setting up like a two, five, one, getting us back to F minor. If any of these terms I'm talking about don't make much sense, don't worry. You can just take out the ideas about the articulation, the shape, the phrasing. All of that stuff is just as important as some of the more like nitty gritty theory stuff. But anyway, if you think of this as a B flat minor chord, you'll notice that he's got the same numbers as this first measure. We've got three, three, again, a natural seven, two, two, and then almost the same here. Instead of like here, we had two sevens. Here, we've got seven, one. So if we play that first bit on the piano, we've got. And then the second half, we've got this. So you've got that same shape and you've got the same degrees. So for the more experienced improvisers out there, this is a really nice melodic idea. And it doesn't have to apply specifically to these numbers, but basically you could say, if I say played one, three, two, one, let's say I do that on an A minor chord. I could then, if I get to an F minor chord next, I can play one, three, two, one there. And it can even work if you're changing, uh, say from a minor chord to a major chord. If say the next chord was a B flat major chord, I can go and do one, three, two, one in B flat major. The thing that's gluing it all together is that we've got this one, three, two, one. All right, so that's the intro. Now we'll get to where he starts to phrase this melody. So check out the first phrase of this melody. So first of all, have a listen to what he does to this last note, this one that's tied over. He's putting a big scoop into it and that gives it a really lyrical quality. Often singers will do this when they're approaching an important note in the melody. They can often bend into the note to kind of emphasize it. Have another listen. Now, the way you can do this is as you're blowing, if you think of the sound oi and you start with o with your tongue flat at the back and then go oi, you'll notice when you say oi, your the back of your tongue comes up and you'll notice that will affect the pitch. 
Now just a word of caution with these scoops, he does them only very occasionally and they're always very controlled. It can be quite a common thing with more amateur players that they tend to scoop loads and loads of notes once they learn how to do it and it can come across as a bit much, but a nicely timed scoop can be a really effective way to emphasise a note. All right, so we'll listen to this phrase and then we'll carry on. All right, so over here on this phrase, this is where we've still got a variation in the rhythm. So in the original song, we just have quarter notes here and it walks up like. And here we've got one, two. So along with jazzing up that rhythm of approaching this G, he's also putting this D in between. Now this is a particularly nice note to choose for a couple of reasons. It's the same as this note we had here, so we've got some kind of continuity, but also this is a chord tone. This D, when we think about it in terms of the E flat major seven chord, is the seventh. And so jumping to a chord tone is a really nice way to start to vary a longer note. All right, so carrying on with the next two phrases from here, have a listen to what he's doing. Okay, so this phrase is fairly straightforward. It's very similar to the original, which again, in the original, it just walks up. Whereas in this one, we've got, and that just adds a bit more momentum to the phrase. But this last phrase is where we're starting to get a bit more variation going on. In the original, we just have something walking up like this. Whereas here, we've got these extra two notes, this C and D, and then he's turning these into triplets to get them in time. And then instead of just hanging on this E flat, which is the main note that the melody finishes on in the original, we've got this little answer phrase here. So check that out one more time from here. So that's the end of the first A section. Now, one thing to notice is he hasn't actually put in loads of new notes. We've got this one note here, this D, and we've got this little answer phrase here and these two little approach notes. Now, apart from that, he's really sticking to the original melody at the beginning. And this is a really nice tactic when you're starting to put your own versions of tunes together. Start with the variations fairly minimally and that gives you somewhere to go later on in the song. So check it out all together in context from the beginning. <laughs> All right, moving on, we start from here. This is known as our second A section, which takes us to here, really. And you can see the chords are the same. And if you were to look at the original lead sheet, you would see the melody is almost identical apart from the last phrase. But notice how differently Stan Getz plays this section, but it's still recognizably the tune. <laughs> So his first phrase is probably one of the closest to the original melody. We've got the same three quarter notes, but he's moved them into two beats. So he's made them triplets just to squeeze them a bit closer, make them a bit faster, but they're exactly the same as the original melody. And again, there's a little bit of a scoop onto this note. Check this out. Now for this second phrase, this is where he's really starting to change the melody. Just to compare what he played in this part of the A section was here. Okay, uh, but here we've got, and we've got this note here, this B natural, which you may think, well, isn't that not gonna clash with our B flat seven chord? Well, this B natural is what's known as a flat nine interval. Um, it's because we have one, three, five, seven. The ninth is normally C, but if we lower it, we get a B natural. And we have this really tense kind of emotive sound. It really wants to resolve back down and then the melody moves on to the G. Now the reason why this still sounds like the melody is all because of this G here. That's our main landing note. That's kind of like the target of the phrase. In the original melody, we're coming up to it from below. And in this version, we're approaching it from above. But it's still three notes. The original, B flat, C, D. This version, B flat, B, B flat but then we hit our target note. 
and you can have a go at this approach as well. A lot of the times you'll be able to quite clearly identify what the main note of a phrase is or the target note. It's often longer or it's at the beginning of the bar. These are often indications, but you can normally just use your ears and go, yeah, I'm going to keep that note where it is but instead of approaching it from below, I'm gonna try approaching it from above. And these kind of things help keep the song sound more interesting and fresh for you and the listener. But notice as well how he's doing this on the second A. On the first A, he stuck more to the melody, and now he's bringing in these variations once he's kind of established the melody. Okay, next up, we've got this same idea of approaching from above, but now from an even greater height. Check this out. <laughs> So we're coming right down from this D. Again, F, if we go back to the original A section, F was our target note. And down here, it's the same target note. Okay, and this last phrase of the A section, check this out. Now this is coming back more closely to the original melody. In the original melody, we just have this phrase. And here we've got this. So the only real new note is this G here. The rest of these notes are from the original melody. He's just squeezing them into a smaller space and playing them as eighth notes. That's nice to do as well, as you can think of these as adding kind of like melodic tension. We're getting further and further away from the original melody, and then we come back closely again. Let's check it out from the beginning so we can hear it all in context. <laughs> Okay, so next up we've got this first phrase of the B section here. So in terms of articulations, listen to what he's doing to this D here. Notice how he cuts that really short. Now Stan Getz is known for being the most kind of lyrical and often legato players, but he'll still use staccato notes to really great effect. And here this adds like a really nice moment of space and tension. And then check out what he's doing on this note here at the end of it. We've got that vibrato at the end to help kind of shape the note. And adding that vibrato at the end of the note, that wah, 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 kind of gives it loads more energy and life. And this is definitely something you can play around with when you're trying your own versions as well. You'll normally find that staccato notes are quite effective at the end of a run of notes. You notice how these first two notes are very legato and then he hits this short note here on the D. And that's what makes that D really stand out. Now in terms of his phrasing, again, he's doing most of the change in the middle of the phrase, but he's always ending on the same note as in the original melody. In the original we have, and here we've got. All right, carrying on with this phrase, we've got this. So listen to this F in particular, he's really shaping this note. He's kind of scooping into it, there's vibrato on it. It's not just bah, like a straight note. And then at the end here, this G, even though it's fairly short, he gets into that vibrato quite quick towards the end. Now melodically here in the melody, we normally have just B flat, A flat, G. We just have those three notes. But what Stan Getz does is kind of like a melodic enclosure. We've got this A flat above the G, but then we come below and then approach into the G from below. And so we get this really nice effect of approaching that G from above and below. Now this next phrase is amazing. Listen to what he does here. <laughs> All right, it's really subtle, but it's really effective. In the original, we have this. where we don't have this A flat in the original. And instead of having, we actually just have quarter notes and we have two notes of each. We have two A flats and two Fs in the original. Landing on this D. Now it's not often that when people are adding in variations that they simplify the melody. But this is what's so nice about this phrase is he's actually taking notes away from the melody, but it still sounds like the melody. And he's just pushing it back by an eighth note to give it some more rhythmic interest. 
Okay, so we'll listen back again, and this time we're going to carry on and include this next phrase here. Check this out. <laughs> All right, so as we get closer and closer to the end of the tune before launching into his solo, the phrases get more and more decorated. In the original, this is literally just a long G here, as these chords are changing underneath with... Uh... But here what we've got is a chromatic approach. We're starting on this B flat, and we're working our way down, landing on that melody note. And you can think of this section here as like a little answer phrase. And what's going on here is a little enclosure of this seventh. We're landing on an F7, so E flat is the seventh of F7. And those two notes before, D, F, land us onto that E flat. And then we walk down chromatically again. And that gives us a nice kind of answer to this first chromatic. So we had this here, and then we're walking down here. And again, these kind of mimicking of the shapes and melodies, that's what makes it so melodic, because your ear can pick out these similarities. It's not just a load of random notes coming at you. And to finish off, you can kind of think of this really as more of like a solo break, as how he's getting into the first phrase of his solo. Check this out. <laughs> Okay, this phrase is amazing. It kind of starts like a blue scale. This first bit here we've got, which is just comes from our C blue scale. But then we have these three notes here. This is what's called an enclosure again. We're really heading towards this note G and we're going one half step above, A flat, one half step below, and then we hit the G. And you hear this all the time in kind of minor tonalities. We're hitting this C minor chord and often you'll enclose the fifth. You'll go above semitone of fifth. There's lots of like jazz cliched phrases like and here we've got a bit of that with starting with the blues and then we have that enclosure there. And here this phrase is great as well. We've got this like dramatic leap up from the G up to the E flat and then we're coming down. And that shape of five, three, two, one, if we're thinking in C minor, that's a really common melodic shape. And then we're kind of delving in more into the blues scale here with that. That's kind of from our, that G, G flat, or F sharp, F. And your ear is kind of leading you, you think you're gonna land on like an E flat, but actually we hit this E natural which sets up E natural is the third of this C7 and that sets up this kind of C7 phrase. C7 is the five chord because the first chord of the solo we're going to F minor. So this chromatic approach is kind of doing two things. We're kind of hinting at the blue scale but also chromatically approaching this note E and putting a chord tone right at the beginning of the bar and approaching it from a couple of semitones above or a couple of semitones from below. That's a really nice exercise you can have a go at playing. Now of course that is for the more advanced improvisers but the broader idea say of when you have a big leap up with a melody then comes stepping back down. That's a nice rule of thumb with melodies. A big leap up normally sounds good stepping down. And the opposite is often true as well. If you do a big leap down, then often stepping back up kind of helps keep that melody feeling balanced. All right, so let's listen to all of that second half of the melody so you can hear it all in context. <laughs> so good. Now along with this transcription I've also put together another version where we've got this transcription as like a player one part and then a second line we've got the original melody so you can kind of do a direct comparison to see straight away how the melody is being changed from one to the other. And again that content is available for premium members. Now if you do become a premium member you'll also get access to all the courses as well. 
On my site, I've also got a learn to improvise course, which will step you through right from the very beginning. So if you want to learn how to improvise and you've never done it before, this course starts you right from the very beginning and steps you up all the way through so that you'll be able to look at tunes like this and make up your own solos. All right, that's it for this week. Let me know in the comments what you think of this format and if you enjoy this style of lesson. Of course, if you're new to the channel, don't forget to hit subscribe so you don't miss out on future lessons and I'll see you guys next week.